Hello, thank you for joining us. Welcome to this webinar event. This is one of many such webinar-based professional development events brought to you by Texas Instruments Australia as part of our ongoing support for teachers in the classroom. Today's topic, what's new with the TI Inspire CX2? And our presenter this evening is Mr. Texas Instruments Australia himself, the Inspired Fox, Peter, Peter Fox. Good evening, Peter. Hello, Brian, how are you? I am just living the dream, my friend. Uh, and it's lovely to be hosting yet another of your presentations uh, on the webinar. Um, and attendees, my name in the background is Brian Lannan. I'm the host of this event. So we'll be talking CX2 about... And, uh, CX2 CAS, yep. Yeah, correct. We're talking about both these units. So almost everything that we cover in this session applies to um, both platforms because I know we have some people from Queensland, some from overseas, some IB users that are particularly interested in the CX and of course the CX CAS or the CX2 CAS. So we'll start by having a look at what we call the premium software. Teachers up until now have perhaps had teacher software um, and talking to some of the teachers they're a little bit reluctant to jump onto the premium software. They're worried that it's going to be completely different. Well, it, it is very familiar, as you'll see as we work through this session. Um, and the advantage that you have, if you move across to the premium software, which has been a free upgrade, but it is a new uh, license number, which you'll get if you haven't got one, you can fill in the request form and that will extend from your current version. You'll need that license number. And you can actually have both versions running on your computer if you like. Not at the one time, but both versions can run. Um, but I installed the premium software, obviously, as soon as it came out, and I haven't moved back to the old version. One of the advantages that you'll have is if you have a classroom where there's a mixture of students on the CX and then the CX2, you can talk to both groups through the software if you're using the premium version. But if you're using the previous version, let's say you're using 4.4 or 4.5 earlier versions, you'll find that it won't recognize a CX2 because that's newer than the product that you're using. So there's one good reason to use the premium software or at least upgrade to it. Another reason is that when you get the premium software, you get two bundles for the price of one. We've put both the CAS and non-CAS software bundled in. So if you're using the teacher software, you now have both versions for sure. And the only thing you've got to remember is which one's the CAS and which one's the non-CAS. I've had people contact me and say, I can't get the solve command anymore, it's gone. Well, you clicked on the red icon. You want the blue one if you're using CAS and the red one if you're using the non-CAS. So that's one of the things that we need to remember. You'll have both. The other thing that you can do to the um, new software is if you have a look in the window uh, menu, there's a little option up the top that says Enable TI Inspire CX Navigator. And to me, it's one of the best tools that you'll have to work with students and their calculators. Because if you've ever been to, well, it's certainly one of my workshops, but any workshops on the calculator, you'll find they often have these little yellow caps. And there's a really cool thing where you can actually see what's going on every single kid's calculator. So previously, the Navigator software was a separate entity. Now it's embedded in this premium software. So that's part of the free upgrade, that you have the software to communicate with your students' calculators. The little yellow adapters you can see that just dropped in on those calculators, they need to be purchased or acquired through the volume purchase program. You put those on top of the kids' calculators. A little access point about the size, not much bigger than a business card, plugs into your laptop. And then all you need to do is start setting up classes. Now that might sound complicated. I'm here to tell you that it's not. Let me show you 
how easy it is to set up a class. The first thing you need to do is start the spreadsheet. Get your students' names in the spreadsheet. You can see my students in there. Um, borrowed some, Callum Murray. Um, we've got Robin Banks and Joe King and Bill Board. Some interesting student names. Once you've got all your student names in a spreadsheet, you simply do a save as, and you can save it as a comma delimited file, a CSV, and then you just click save. It'll give you all sorts of messages. Oh, you're not saving everything that's important. Well, no, I am. I just need a CSV file. So you can bypass this step. You can type names in automatically, but somewhere on your school system will be an electronic list of student names. So I've got my student names in a spreadsheet. Then the next thing I want to do is add those names into Navigator. So we go back into the Navigator software and you can see there's this thing called class. So once you've enabled it through that little window up the top, you can see mine actually says disable. Well, that's because I've already got it enabled. But you'll see these other menus that are sitting there and one of them called class. So I'll click on that one. And in the class tab, you can see there's an option on the left-hand side to add a student to the current class, or you can create a whole new class. Now, I've got a class running here, so I'm just going to stop that one. I've got some menus in the way. Let me just move them out of the way. I'll end that class. And now I can add an entire class. So I'll do that now. You'll see how long it takes to set up. I've got an option to add them manually or upload. I'll do upload. Now I've just got to go and find it. That's probably the most challenging part. There they are, methods I called them. And I'll click next. And then I just have to align um, the details in that list. So class name, I called that class. I don't need to fill in section name. Uh, I've got first name, I called a list first name. I've got last name. And I've got a username. Next. OK. And then I can go and find my methods class. And there's all my students added to my roster. And now I can begin the class and the kids can start logging in. So if you've got a navigator system at your school, which a lot of schools do, you're up and ready. You're ready to go, which is kind of cool, I right? I love using Navigator, Peter. Uh, it's just yeah. one of the most powerful, to, most empowering tools for me as the teacher, um, you know, since it's actually getting Inspire itself. But there, there is actually something uh, amiss with your class register. I'm sorry if you didn't realise it. Um, you've got the students in, enrolled there. Um, Teresa is not there. Oh, Teresa Green. That is oh, the one. Yes. And, Ed, and, um, and Edna. Edna Bucket. Don't know Edna. What was that yeah. one? Ed, Edna Bucket sorry. and Teresa Green. Yeah, sorry, mate. Oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> There's a few others that I chose not to put in the class. Probably not appropriate. Um, yeah, I kept, I kept nice it appropriate. One, I, yeah. yeah, thanks. <laughs> So once you've got your class up and running, you can see it only took us what, about a minute to run that up. Um, and then you can do capture class and click on OK. And it says, oh, my students haven't joined the class yet. Well, I just happen to have a calculator on my desk here. I'm getting a lot of crackling at your end, Brian. Oh, OK. Yeah, um, I was just going to throw in another comment. When I, when I did get this for my school, um, I did, it cost me nothing. I actually got it through the volume purchase program, Those yeah. uh, the yellow Wi-Fi adapters that you showed before. Uh, it's such an empowering tool, but, but I got it for free, basically. Nice. Yeah. So I don't know if you're going to tell us about how that works, but the, the volume purchase program, I, I just kept a copy of the... Um, 
the invoice from when we ordered the calculators through the school to then on sale to the students. I sent that off to TI, I guess that's you, your office, and yeah. next thing I got, a, I got a package with the Wi-Fi adapters and also the charging bays for the calculators, which was pretty pretty yes. useful. Yeah, that's, yep. it is. And so the Wi-Fi while adapters. Brian was telling so, you about, yeah. Now, while Brian was telling you about the um, volume purchase program, you can see Joe King yep, and Bill Board have both logged in. Uh, Annette Curtin is still outside somewhere. And Robin Banks, I think she was pulled up by the police. But anyway, and Kelly Murray's probably still on a TV show somewhere. Um, hey. And then anything that those students do on their calculators will then be picked up and I can capture them up here. I can even take a live feed and project it on the board. We can collect data from students and so on. So it's a pretty cool system to have. And you can see Joe King is now busy doing something on his calculator. So yeah, yeah, and, that's and the, you can accountability for the students. You see what they're doing, which is great. Oh yeah, yeah. Yes, um, Peter, just one, one other. Uh, we just had a request come in the spreadsheet that you had before. Someone has asked if you yeah. could perhaps share that again. They're possibly looking for those names, <laughs> but but how oh, that was spreadsheet? Yeah. Yeah. So it's literally just a first name, last name, username, and the class. Now the reason why it has a class is if you've got six different classes. You can have all six of them imported at once and it will group them by that class name. So you don't have to upload every class separately. I do just because I'm old fashioned, I guess. Um, but if you had all six classes in the one spreadsheet, it'll upload the whole lot and sort them into groups based on that class name. Um, the headings don't really matter as long as they make sense to you. You could have a Christian name, you could have it um, surname, whatever you want to have as long as they make sense to you and represent what's in that list. Um, I just use, as the kids' username, I've just got a combination of their surname and first name, but you can have their username that they've got from their school system if you wanted to. Yeah. Alrighty. So you saw me capture the student screens there before. So. I've got something here, um, a puzzle that I've done, and this is to do with the new programming feature, which we'll look at soon or later in this session. Um, and it just generates a picture, a picture based on the number that I typed in. So I'm going to run puzzle 45, and that's all it does. Nothing particularly exciting, it's just the number 45 with some coloured bands around it. So. If I had enough students in front of me to do this, then we could see pictures like this come up on the screen. Now, we've got quite a few people on board tonight, so I'm not sure how well Brian's going to go filtering all of the guesses, but I'm just going to throw a couple of these images up, and it's a problem-solving task for the students to figure out what it's actually showing and in as much detail as they can possibly describe. So yeah, if you reckon you know, just type it, into the, type it into the chat. Yeah, type and it into the chat space. And for the first correct answer. That's it. If you go and visit Brian, he'll have a beer with you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say it's actually a free ticket to our next webinar. There you go. So now we've got two kids that have typed in numbers. Um, we've got a 12 there, we've got a 15 there. Let's capture another student. Now that's an interesting one. We can see some similarities between the 12 and the 20, other than just they both have twos in them. But they've both got three little segments. And there's some colour matching going on as well. And now we can be thrown out a little bit because 21 looks somewhat different, although it has something similar to 15. So 21 has two bands, 15 has two bands. They both have a blue band involved. There's 30. And again, this is just using the screen capture tool, but even if you don't have Navigator, you can have the student show their screen or draw it on the board or whatever 
you can still be running this program or you could just have the kids do it by themselves and run this little program, um, which I'll leave in the uh, webinar, post webinar files that you can play around with. Um, and the kids could just sit there, type the numbers in until they figure out what it's doing. Oh, one of our oh, I've got, participants yeah, people are on, it. on to it, is she? Yeah? Yeah the, um, yeah, the board's lighting up, Foxy. <laughs> Uh oh. Yep. All right. So <laughs> this is good. 36 it's is good actually the first are... time we see four little bands. Uh, Stephen's worked that out. Yep, he's working out the colours. Uh, oh, nice. Has he yep. got a, Has he got something attached to any of those colours yet? That might give uh, the yes, others a has. clue. He has. He's got it. Um, yep. Ken. Ken oh, Ken's very close. He's talking about odds and evens. A few ah. yeah, uh, yeah. I actually oh, worked like with that. Ken. I think I know which Ken that is. I've worked with Ken before. <laughs> He's a very cool person. Diane is seeing a similar thing. Uh, yep, yep. It's all over. It's all over. It. Sorry, sorry, mate. The uh, secret's it? out. Hel Hel Helen's got it. She's got it all. It's yep. You've just, you've just given us too, much, know, too many clues there. Rewind the, the <laughs> webinar afterwards. <laughs> well done. It's lovely to see people participating like that. Yep. All right. Uh, Give, give them a call, Orange, Brian. Is, orange is, is 11, says Heath. Yeah. Yes, it is, which means yes, that the purpley sort of colour is 5. And once we know that, we can have a look at that 15 there and figure out the blue is probably 3. And therefore, we'll go back to the previous one and the red is 2. Yes, it's prime factorisation by colour. So it's kind and of cool that we can... I'm, going to, I'm just looking back through the chat history. I think I'm going to have to award it to Helen, who was the first to tell us that. So congratulations, Helen. Um, we'll, be, we'll be sending you out some free tickets to our next webinar. That's it. Yep. All righty. So next thing. So that's the a combination of the Navigator software, which is all bundled into this new Teacher Premium software, and the drawing tools as part of the coding section which we'll look at later in this webinar and in a, in a little bit of detail. Um, so back to here where we've got two products bundled in one, but there's another feature that's in CX2 and that is if your students have got the CX2 CAS calculator and they want to or the teacher wants to switch the CAS functionality off, they can now do that. Now there's a couple of ways you can do it in terms of if the students just want to practice away from using the CAS functionality, that is commands like solve and differentiate, and so on, in fact, factor anything that involves some algebra will be blocked. Even if the kids just type a mathematical equation in and press enter, it says that's CAS functionality, we can't do it. So if a teacher wants to turn that off, they can with the CX2 CAS models. You can't with the older ones but you can with a CX2. Obviously on the CX2 non-CAS, you can't turn CAS on. It's a non-CAS platform, but the CAS platform covers both fields. So that's been approved if you're in an area that's using IB. Um, that's where you'll find that sort of functionality being used because the CX2 CAS has been approved in non-CAS mode, um, but also in uh, Queensland, they're doing the same thing you can use the CX2 CAS with the CAS functionality disabled. Now you're probably wondering where I get that information from in terms of how do I do it. On the home screen you can go into settings and then choose document settings and you can see here calculation mode, CAS mode down the bottom, well not quite down the bottom, and there's three options. CAS on, which means the calculator will function as normal. Exact arithmetic, that is actually CAS disabled. But if you did say sine of 45 degrees, it'll write root two on two. It'll provide an exact result. Um, if you did E squared, it'll write it as E squared. Um, off means not only is the CAS switched off, but so too is the exact arithmetic. So whatever environment you're in, you need to make sure you choose the appropriate setting, on, exact, or off. On is the only one where CAS is enabled. Now, 
If I just clicked OK and went back to my document, there's nothing stopping me from coming back to the settings and switching it back on again, obviously. But in a test or an assessment situation, you can put the kids in press to test and then the only way they can re-enable the CAS is to get out of press to test. So once they walk past that test or exam line, that border to the classroom, you can have their CAS disabled until you choose to switch it back on. Which of course, on the actual software, you can enter press to test and exit press to test for the whole class, particularly if you're using Navigator. So that's a really cool way to switch that sort of functionality on and off. So, click for another new feature. Now, time for another one. So, there's two graphs on the screen, or for our South Australian viewers, two graphs. Um, so what can we do here? Access attributes. There's a few things you can do with access attributes, and there's a new one which means now you can go and put values along each hash mark. And it's actually a very clever tool because if the hash marks are too close to one another and it would make it too busy, it just won't do it. It waits until they're spread out enough. Now for something like we've got on the screen at the moment, not really critical, no, but I've purposely chosen it in jumps of two because previously you would have only seen the first marking and perhaps the last. So we know what happens. Kids are now going to work out what's it going up by, which is not a bad thing. Or they'll say the next one is three, so they can misinterpret what the hash marks are for. Um, but I actually like it for things like trigonometric functions. We're going to have pi on four, pi on two, three pi on four, and so on. I think that's a cool setup. So let's see how to do that on the software or on the calculator. So I've got a graph application running. These hash marks are quite close together at the moment. So we'll see if it works. I'll just place the mouse over the axes and then a right click and I've got the option for attributes. So it's got to say axes. Then you right mouse click and on the calculator that's control menu and we'll choose attributes. And we get this lovely long list of stuff, some zoom options. The third one down is the one that we're after. And you can see by those arrows, we can go left or right. I'll go left. And we can see it's just dropped all the numbers in for us. And that's it. That's how easy it is to switch that feature on. You go to the axes, select your attributes, and navigate down to where the numbers are located, and away you go. So let's see what happens if I now went into my window settings and I'll say negative 2 pi to 2 pi and steps of pi on 4 and negative 3, 3, 1. And you'll see it automatically switches them off because we changed all the settings. But again, just right click, attributes, arrow down. Now, you see now, they're obviously too close together. So as I spread it out, I'll get, once I get out far enough, I'll actually get them all back on. I'm not sure why they haven't come back on yet. Let's try again. Attributes. My computer, apologies for the fact that my computer's running a bit slow. There they are, so pi on four, pi on two, etc. So now when you're doing your trigonometric functions, it's a bit easier for students to see those increments. That's Axie's attributes. I also like the fact that you're just typing pi for pi. Yes, there's some nice keyboard shortcuts. Oh, look. The other thing I should mention while I'm at it is we have a, a few, two videos up recently, one on navigation tips on YouTube, the other one is on um, keyboard shortcuts because there's some wonderful keyboard shortcuts. A lot of people don't realise if, if you tap on that Pi key, we, we have that little fly-out menu, 
you can just multiple tap and it scrolls through that menu. That might not seem much on the computer software, but that is really cool on the handheld to be able to just keep tapping and then press enter to select yep. the one you're after. I know, the, I know the videos you're talking about, Peter, and I'm, I will type them into the chat so everyone can see them. Okay, cool. Thank you, sir. Yep. As long as I don't watch them instead of watching this. Um, oh, all right, oh, no, so no, path no. plot. Save it for later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Plot path is another cool one. Now, at the moment, you might want to have a quick guess. Brian got this almost instantly, um, so don't, don't give it away yet, Brian. I'm sure they'll figure out what's going on you can actually get it to gradually draw one or more graphs. So it kind of reveals them, and you can pause it, it animates it. We know that the visual tools are really cool, but so is motion. Anything that's animated, students are more likely to look at it and stay tuned in to something that's animated. Now, again, we could do this before, but you had to know a lot in order to get it to do. You had to play some tricks and ran with the domain of the function and so on. So I'll show you how easy it is to do this plot part. So I'll get rid of that one. We've seen our color by numbers. So the one that you saw on the screen was something like this, x squared. And then we had, oh, here's another keyboard shortcut, shift and minus. People have probably seen that one before. All those sorts of lovely tips are in that video. So we've got these. Now, I might choose to hide those labels. I might not want to show them. So in the menu in here under settings, I'll hide those labels. Now, here's the new feature, menu, trace, path plot and we'll do it for a function and that's it that's all you have to do oh you do have to press play so now it's just generating those two paths and animating as it comes along we'll see our quadratic coming in soon we can see the coordinates down on the bottom right hand side of the screen and that's it and that's our Path plot. You can rewind at any time. And the first question the teacher asked me was, can you actually make it slow down? Well, not quite, not quite, but it's, it's a bit tricky. What I'll do is I'll, um, I'll get rid of that one and I'll create a new one and we'll do a different graph because if we're going to slow it down, we'll, we'll might as well demonstrate a different type of path plot. This time we'll do a parametric one. So, hopefully no surprises for that one. Same graph, same, same, but different. So, Menu, Trace, Path Plot. But before I capture, and you can see I've got the option for parametric, but before I do that, I'm going to choose Path Setup. And Parametric. And let's not do an automatic step size. Let's make it high on 36. We could potentially slow it down even further. In other words, that's how much it's going to increment by. So you might have key features that you want to show. Um, and you can have future paths so you can see where it's going if you wanted to. Now, that's the path set up. And now we go back in and do our path plot. Press play. And we can see that there's a difference between those two parametric functions in the way they've been entered, but also obviously now we can see that the way that they're graphed is different. Um, and while we're talking about parametrics, you could have two paths crossing, but not at the same time. Now we're imposing the time on it, so you could have, say, a 
someone throwing a ball and someone chasing the ball. The paths cross, but they don't catch the ball because they're not in the same spot at the same time. So you can animate those things, path plot. Very cool tool. Very cool. Right. And it's something that I'm, I was saying before, back in back in the day, I'm going back, oh, crops 20, 25 years, when, when we had the old um, TI-83s, because it was the processor was slower when we graphed functions, there was actually some some teaching value in seeing it as it was plotted. But yes. as the process got faster, they, the, the graph, it instantly appears. And so I feel that we've kind of lost that, you know, let's watch it, let's watch it trace as it plots. Uh, so yeah. they've brought and, that and also there's, is good. Yeah. there's still value in kids plotting an actual function themselves. Um, yeah whether it be physically walking it, as we've done before, um, or plotting yeah. it with pen and paper. Those sorts of skills are still important. Um, and, and I think, yeah, you're right, seeing it gradually produced, as you will in this yeah. case, a nice segue, Brian, um, into looking at plot point. So let's have a look at what mm. plot point does. So I'm going to create another document. I'll just get a new one. Don't want the old one. Graph. So, using the geometry tool, you can plot a point. But there's now a keyboard shortcut. So, if I press P, and that doesn't matter whether it's on the calculator or your computer software, I can plot points. So that's a shortcut, right? What's new is the second one point by coordinates. All right. So I'll choose option two. And let's suppose I want to put the point specifically at two, three. That's kind of cool, but I can just plot a point at a specific location um, very quickly. Just P, select option two, and type the values in. But we, we didn't stop there, right? So I'm going to just undo that. And I'll press P. And coordinates by points. And I'm going to type in A. Press Enter. And then I'm going to type in 2A minus 1. Now this is weird because whereabouts is A stored? We don't have a value for A. So let's see what happens when I press enter. Well, the default value for A is one on the slider. So not only did it create the point, but because the point called up some value A, which the calculator didn't have defined anywhere, but you could use a defined variable, one that you have elsewhere on the calculator, and it would plot it according to those values. But this is kind of cool because I'm just going to um, minimise this slider. I like working with the minimised. We can watch how this point moves. So we kind of told it that the Y value is double it and subtract one. So whatever the X value is, you double it, then subtract one. And we might be interested in the path that that's going to trace out. So menu. Trace. It's a geometry thing that we're doing. We're plotting points. So now, when I click on my value for A, that's kind of what you're like talking about, wasn't it, Brian? About being able to see the graph come about as we go. All right. So we need something a little bit more exciting than a straight line for the punters. I'm guessing. So, I'll create, I could just undo all the things I just did, but th this is quicker for what we're doing. I'm going to put some functions in. I'm going to have sine x plus x on 2. And we'll do cos x plus x on 2. And I'll press P for my plot. Points by coordinates, A. Um, I'm just thinking whether I want it to go that slow. Hmm. Yeah, I'll do that one. 
A and F1 of A. So it creates my slider. And of course, because my rule is the same as the rule that I've typed in, that blue function, and you can see down the bottom there, it's saying one and sine of one plus a half. And I'll change the settings on my slider. We'll start it at zero. We'll go from negative two pi to two pi in steps of pi on six. Hopefully that's not too much. So now I can just get my little point to run along my graph. I'm going to plot another point by coordinates and go 1.1a, enter, f2 of 1.1a. So I'm, I'm kind of bringing out the art side of me, or maybe the science side of me. You can decide which. So I'm going to use my geometry tool and I'll draw a little line segment connecting that point and that point. And let's trace it. Trace that segment. I'm absolutely thinking science. It is a bit sciencey, isn't it? Yep. When I, I lived like in New that. York, I was I was near Coldstream Harbour, where um, uh, Dr. Watson, who was one of the co-discoverers of this. Uh, worked. Have we got any punters think they know what it is? Mm. My, my magical little piece of artwork for this evening. I've got, I got more artwork, by the way. Much better artwork <laughs> than that. So, of course, a little strand of DNA. Playing around. The right, name so of the CSIRO student magazine is Double Helix. Yes, it is. Very good. Mm. All right, so last one we're going to go through, and this one's huge. So I've saved a little bit of time for it, um, is this idea of a canvas for programming. So let me get rid of my double helix. And this time I'm going to run a new program. And I'll call it stuff. That's what I call it when I don't know what to call it. Stuff it means I can delete it. Um, and I'll go into a programming menu. Oh, look at that. There's a new one down the bottom called Draw. Well, we'll have a play. Number nine, draw shapes. I can draw a line, a rectangle, circle. Now, if you recall back at the start of the webinar, I had the numbers and we had the colors. So it's actually drawing arcs. Actually, I was drawing in filled in arcs. And you just specify the angle and so on. You can play around with these tools. And that's all I was doing to create that program. So it's not a big program. All I had to do was work out the prime factorization and then decide what colors I wanted to align to each factor and where I wanted to start. And then away it went. But let's not go too complicated. So we will just draw a line. And if we think about what the syntax might be, you need a start point and an end point. It would make sense to talk about um, X and Y, and then X and Y, so X1, Y1, X2, Y2. So we'll start by 0, 0, and we'll go 100, and we'll go 150, only so that you can see the difference between where it is on the X and Y. And punters might like to think whereabouts it's going to draw that line. So control R will compile that program and get it ready to run. You notice it's added a calculator page. This was in the previous version too, by the way. Control R gets the program ready to run, adds the calculator application, and then press enter. We are now in a space that we haven't seen before. There's no more tabs. We're in what's called a canvas. So it turns your calculator screen into a canvas for a drawing. And we can see, kind of weird, zero, zero is up in the top left-hand corner. And given that I went down 150, I can see the Y values must extend beyond 150 
and I'm probably only about a third of the way across the screen, so I'm thinking the X values, if I'm trying to figure out what the dimensions are of the screen, it's probably close to 200, right, and 300. Think about the aspect ratio of the screen when you're doing that, and we're almost there. So that's just drawing a line. You can set the color of the line. You can set the thickness of the line. Um, let's try something different other than a line. Draw, shape, rectangle. So if I draw a rectangle, what we need to do is think about what sort of characteristics it would need. It probably needs a starting point. So let's try 10, 10. And we don't know whether it's going to draw the bottom right-hand corner or whether it needs the width and the height or the height and the width. If we think about it, it's probably width then height. That would make sense X and Y. So I'm going to type in 100 and then 50. So if we see a long, narrow rectangle going across the screen, then that's correct. We go. So we can position that rectangle wherever we like. If you wanted to color the rectangle in, let's go through. So I'm going to go in the catalog because you can see these drawing commands. I'll press D and scroll down until I see draw. There's, there's some there. Draw arc, draw circle. Draw circle is fairly obvious, right? Put the center and then the um, radius. Draw line, as we said before, x1, y1, x2, y2. Draw poly is an interesting one. Draw rectangle, that was the one we are just talking about, with width and height. We can draw text, that's what I used before to draw some of that stuff. And the other one we had was um, a fill, a rectangle, I think it was. Yeah, there we go. Fill rectangle. Doesn't look much different than the other one, does it? Except we have to nominate the color that we're using first. So we'll try the fill rectangle one now. But while we're in there, let's have a look at shapes. No. Control. Yes. Set color. Now, if you've used the Innovator or any other color tools on a computer, you would know it's probably RGB, red, green, blue. So let's go for 255 red. And we'll try zero green and say 100 blue, RGB. And now we'll try our fill rectangle. Menu, draw, shapes, fill, rectangle. And we'll try um, our stunning coordinates. Let's try 10, 10, what we did before. We'll go 200 wide and we'll go 100 high and run it. Now I've got a weird sort of funky red -y color rectangle. And of course, if you draw stuff over the top of it, it fills in. And you can get the kids just to have random circles going across the screen because you don't have to keep the same thing. You could have random circles. So um, let's change that to a circle. Shapes, fill, circle. And remember it wanted a um, let's try 0 to, uh, not 0, I'm going to try 50 to um, 200. So that's my X coordinate. Now I'm doing this on the fly, so hopefully I don't make a mistake. 50 to 150. And then we need a radius. Let's try anything between 10 and 50. So we don't wander off the screen, hopefully. So we'll run that and see if that works. There we go, there's a random circle. So we could Put some random numbers in here. 0 to 255. We might actually, interestingly enough, get some um, 
white circles, which means you won't see them, but let's just copy that. Copy, paste, paste. That's working. We've got a random bluish colored circle. So then why not? I like that. You can go menu, control, or I equals one to 50. Too quick, right? You can slow it down. But yes, that's one amazing tool is that it's very, very fast. Um, and then once you get practice at uh, the drawing tool, then you can find out things like buffers. So you can paint stuff to a buffer and then have it splash up and appear on the screen. Um, or you can use it to pause it and have um, check to see if there's a key input. And when a key is put in, so someone presses a plus sign or the, the delete key or the control key, then you can make it do something else. So you could play Pong, I guess, if you really wanted to program that and have little paddles going up and down. Um, you couldn't do it between two students, though, other than using the same calculator. That's just kind of weird now. Um, or you could do what um, one of our T-Cube trainers did overseas, any wavy lines. Let's try wavy lines. Some of you might recognize that. You can just have that as your screensaver on your calc and just run and run and run until you press escape. Oh, yes, I saw that little Brian, uh, question there, Brian. Yes, the CX2, just because it's premium software, those yellow Wi Fi adapters work with both the CX and the CX2 calculators. That's correct. Now, so far, all I've been doing is um, little pictures with our drawing canvas. You don't just have to do little pictures. I encourage people to check out the other webinar that we did on um, coding with this, these new drawing tools. But to give you another idea on if you wanted something slightly more mathematical, you can kind of have a guess what this one's going to do. So that's it. Hopefully people have figured out what that program does. And no, stem and leaf plot is not a built-in feature of the calculator. That is just a program using the drawing tool that's created a stem and leaf plot for us. Now that's the code right. itself, yeah, the code itself is a little bit tricky, but not too bad. It depends on how much control you want. So the syntax I set up for mine is you just have to put in the variable where the information is stored. So I've got one over here. And there's my data. So it looks at, you can see I was playing around because I called another list back up. <laughs> so um, it actually sorts the data in the program itself. Um, these are all commands that are available. So if you've got a list, let's say, um, oh, I'll better not call it data, I'll call it B. Um, three, five, two, one, seven, eight, six, five. Sort a. So there's built in commands that you can use in any program or anything like that. It's automatically sorted your list. Um, you just have to be careful if you're sorting two lists that so you don't mix up the pairing of the numbers, obviously. Um, so we're part of the way there. Then we just have to decide. Now, the program that I've got, the one that I wrote, the zero signifies that I want the calculator to determine the appropriate stem size. But if I want to select the appropriate stem size, then I type a number in. Instead of having zero, I can say, okay, I want it to be in lots of 0.1. Um, I'm not sure whether I completely implemented that, but let's see what happens if I do. And you can see that it's kind of icky, right? That's just, no, <laughs> that's not a stem and leaf plot. So. That's that's still a work in progress. Let's try zero one. Yeah, it's still icky, so we don't want that. Um, but I'm working on that one. At the moment, I've got the calculator deciding on what the stem plot is. 
what the stem size is rather by just defaulting it off to zero. Then I'll work on getting the user to define because you might want 18, 18.5, in other words, go 18, 18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 21, 21, etc. if your leaf is too long. So that's a stem leaf plot. Now, looking at the time, we're just about out of time. Um, the one thing I will show um, as a programming tool, and by the way, if you want more than just the webinar, it's now on our um, 10 minutes of coding. The drawing commands are in there. That's all free lessons that you can do. Um, but just to give you an idea, if you haven't got into the coding yet, I had a teacher contact me and they're doing a thing on viruses, nevertheless, interesting timing. So they said, oh, hmm. having trouble yep. programming this, could, could you do something like this? And yeah, probably about half an hour, I guess, to create a program like this. So let's just run our little virus program and it says, how many people in your group do you want to simulate? So I'll simulate 100 people in the community. The next question is, what is the infectious period? So how long are these people, if they get infected by the virus, how long are they contagious for? So let's say five days. And how many days over which do you want to run the simulation? Let's say 25 days. So now we can see on the screen it says number of infected cases is going up, number of immunities. So what happens is once the person has had the disease, been infected for the seven days, whatever it was, they're then immune to it. They won't catch it again. So you can see the number of immunities building up. We're at day 19. There's no more infections. Everybody's immune, which means, that, and, and there's nobody was unaffected by it. So then if I go on to the next page, let's just do a zoom data. And let's change that to, I think it's YD. There we go. So that's how the infection took off. You can see it took off fairly quickly, but then zeroed back out again, as obviously the whole community had had the disease, and then they're going back through that, getting rid of it, and then the disease disappears. The virus goes away, which is kind of what happens, um, except we have a lot more than 100 people in the population, so it kind of hangs around a bit longer than what we'd hope. But that just gives you some idea what you can do with coding and get the kids to explore. Um, and that's one of the biggest features on our new CX2 is the coding. You have to check it out. So many things you can do with that draw command, as you saw. Stem and leaf plots, pretty pictures. Check out the last one because I did some multiplication tables, uh, another problem-solving task on a chessboard. You name it, you can do it all. So I think we're just about out of time, Brian. I'll pass it back to you unless any of our punters had questions on what they can do on the calculator. I think I've been answering most of the questions as we go there, there, Peter. Um, I think that's a great that's a great uh, example to finish with there, with the, just illustrating the you know quite currently as you as you pointed out the absolute importance of of mathematical uh, modelling. Um, yeah, you know, these are you know quite literally life and death situations. Um, so uh, yeah. Good stuff, and I've also put in into the um, chat there any, uh, a link to our past webinars. Uh, as I indicated earlier, Peter ran a session sp uh, in November last year specifically addressing the drawing commands on the CX2, and the more I see of CX2, there's more and more that I'm learning about it as well. So. Uh, uh, ter terrific to to get into that. I'll just just quickly go back to the um, oh that's the, the the codes I've got there the, the TI codes. But um, just quickly on on the the webinars uh, our upcoming webinars. So you'll see in in the webinar link you've got both things. You've got upcoming webinars, but you can also watch uh, any of the past webinars on demand. And I know that that's something uh, uh, that's a facility that I've used with students in my classroom. Just a trick on that, particularly talking about the students. Next week, our program is predominantly directed at students. Um, some of you may have had your students enrol in our webinars at the end of last year, uh, which we ran in uh, uh, October, in the in, or in yeah September October in in, in the lead up into exams. Um, and 
that was very well subscribed and, and enthusiastically received. Other feedback that we got from you was uh, it would be great if we had some more events specifically for students at the start of the year. So that's what we're doing now. You can see that uh, February the 18th, that's what, next Tuesday, um, we have Stephen Crouch and James Mott presenting for students um, a, 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 a webinar specifically for uh, maths methods and specialist. Now, Stephen was one of our presenters on the specialist maths exam preparation last year, and uh, that was that was very very well received. So please share this with your students. We've also got uh, similar things for the general and further maths. Uh, that's on the Wednesday, um, and with the TI and Spike uh, non-CAS uh, methods and special that would be particularly uh, of use for our Queensland audience. Um, and also you can see on the Thursday we've got another one for the IB. So lots of lots of things happening there. And also the same sort of thing happening for the uh, TI-84 for schools that are using those. Just a concern with that though, to get to that tab, it, it comes under the teachers part um, of the website. So the professional development... They can link to it from the students now as well, Brian. If oh, you go under okay. the students oh. tab, yeah. So student resources, I put a little link in there. So we'll be adding some videos to this space. Fantastic, yep. Yep, so, so now if they uh, go down to get started, we're gonna put some more tabs in here to make it easier for the students. There's gonna be a whole stream of videos like the shortcut one and the navigation tips. I've just done another one on the general form of a straight line. Yep, and scroll down to product tutorials, upcoming live and online. So oh, fantastic, that's a, a new one. So yep. we've got a little link in there, plus the YouTube Getting Started series, the concept series. Um, so we're just gonna add more into there, but they'll also be able to search by um, state and topic and all sorts of things shortly. So we're making it easier for students. Uh, and just, just while I'm on there, Brian, we had someone I assume from Queensland saying that it's raining cats and dogs in their area. Um, just a warning for those people in there, just be careful not to step in a poodle. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, thank you, Peter. We... <laughs> okay, um, so moving right along, uh, that's that's uh, that's Peter on your screen now. Um, so we will thank you very much for um, the expertise you have shared with us uh, this evening, Peter. As I said, Mr. Mr. Texas Instruments, the, the inspired fox, um, an absolute must whenever you see him on our webinars. Uh, I can see the accolades coming in in the chat now. So uh, thank you from myself and the uh, participants. Last opportunity to type a question to Peter or just, a, or just a note of congratulations. When I close the event, you'll be taken to a page where we invite your feedback. Can I ask you please what we are especially looking for at this point? of the year is what you would like to see uh, happen in, in the webinar program. Do you want to see more student tu tutorials? Do you want to see um, things on particular topics, particular year levels, particular platforms? Please let us know so that we can tailor the event to best support you. Um, as always, you will get a, a follow-up email um, which will take you to links for the recording of this event but of course at any time you can go to the archive of past recordings on demand and anyone can do that at any time. Uh, that's both through our own website, you see the link on your page, or through the YouTube channel, uh, Texas Instruments Australia. We know that the students in particular like to use the, the latter of those. Um, the newsletter is certainly something that's, uh, that's worth looking at and I should make an additional slide here because I'm managing our, our new blogs, blog, slide, uh, blog site which is um, t3australia.blog which you can also use to sign up for these things. Um, any questions, there's the phone numbers, Australia and New Zealand and with all of that, I will say a final thank you to all our participants, many, many online this evening, and to the Inspired Fox, Peter, good evening to all.